Hi everybody, it's 2pm and we have Friday forecasting talk. Today we will have a talk by Michele Trovero from SAS and he will uh, tell us something about forecasting software trends for the next decade. It's uh, an interesting title uh, which he came up with, which has two meanings and let's see how he spins this uh, around this, uh, this title. But before we do that, I wanted to say a couple of words as usual about the center. So here is a brief information about us. We provide different sets of services, including short courses, consultancy, master projects, and software development and so on. We have expertise in a wide variety of sectors and areas, including marketing analytics, supply chain forecasting. And here is uh, um, a list of our members of the center. We have nine people at the moment, at least officially. So if you're interested in doing anything with us, don't hesitate and send us uh, an email or get in touch with us via our social media. How to keep updated, how to get in touch with us. We have a Twitter account, uh, Lancaster Simov. We have LinkedIn, so you can follow this link if you want to. And we typically publish our events in these two resources. So if you are interested in our future events, please do follow us there. You can just send us an email or visit our website. And finally, last but not least, we have our YouTube channel where we upload um, videos from different events. So this is 11th. Uh, is it 11th? No, I'm mixing things. Sorry. This is 15th Friday forecasting talk. We will have uh, one more and then we will go for a break. Right, so that's a brief introduction from me. Let's go to Michele. So, Michele, you can share your screen and let's start the presentation. Okay, thank you, Ivan, for the introduction. Um, my name is Michele Trovero. I had the forecasting R&D group at SAS at the SAS Institute. Uh, as you might know, we develop for, uh, forecasting software and other software for data analytics. We've been in the forecasting software arena for uh, longer than I've been at SAS, so for an, at least 20 or more years. Um, and overall, SAS has been in the business of for producing forecasting software for data analytics uh, for over 40 years. And I have personally been in the business of developing forecasting software for uh, 17 uh, uh, or 18 years. I started as a developer, and like I said, now I'm heading the forecasting R&D uh, division in SAS uh, at SAS. Uh, uh, so thanks, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to give this talk. I thought uh, I'll talk a little bit what I see um, from the perspective of an insider, um, all the changes that are going on in the forecasting software arena. Um, and I think the talk will complement um, very well the summary that Oliver gave uh, one of the earlier talk in the series of seminar about uh, the informed survey on uh, forecasting software. Again, this is uh, more of a, my own personal opinion, what I see, what the changes I see going on in the forecasting software. Um, this is my, my own personal opinion, of course, because I, I happen to work at SAS. Um, it also, many of, of my opinions also happen to coincide with the direction that the software, SAS software is taking. Um, but overall, um, again, these are my opinion, they're not SAS. Uh, what I will share are my opinion, not SAS official positions. Um, so what I see right now, I, what I believe is that we are in a pivotal moment for uh, the evolution of the forecasting software. They are driven by two, uh, mainly by two components. On one side, um, evolution in technology, especially with the era of cloud computing, um, opened many opportunities and many challenges in uh, many ways um, for uh, delivering software um, for data analytics. And uh, on the other side, we also have seen in the last few years a uh, large um, change in the type of algorithms that are used for forecasting, especially with the employment of uh, machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, for the purpose of forecasting. Only, one only has to look at, uh, for example, at the results of the 
and five uh, accuracy competition to see that basically machine learning algorithm algorithms uh, swipe the floor when it came to uh, the top positions. So what I will be talking today is some of the trends uh, that I that I see going on, um, and then they're divided in uh, three sections. One is driven by IT, and the second one uh, is driven by process change, and the third one given driven by algorithms change changes. Um, and the goal is. Uh, uh, of course, to uh, to to foster uh, exchange of ideas and uh, and discussion and to stimulate discussion, something that the the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting at the Lancaster University has been known very well for many years, uh, and with this series of seminars in particular. First, I will be talking about IT-driven trends. Um, like I said, the main trends are driven by the advent of cloud computing, the new forecasting software, the modern forecasting software, and the one that will I see um, being developed in the next, uh, maybe not next decade, but certainly for the next uh, uh, several years. Um, the server side, if we look at the, I will be talking first about the architecture, the architecture on the server side, it's cloud native uh, and uh, support as uh, support for public, private and hybrid, cl hybrid clouds. Um, the engines, uh, the analytical engines uh, have distributed data um, and so are distributed analytical engines as well. Their algorithms are designed specifically to work in a cloud environment uh, so that the the computation are moved as close as possible to where the data reside, uh, minimizing the data movement. Uh, the engines are also designed to be resilient. By that, I mean if one of the nodes in the cloud goes down, there is a sufficient result, uh, redundancy in the data and uh, resilience in the, in the engine itself, uh, so there is no disruption. Um, and you, you can see this uh, already in many other areas. Uh, for example, if you um, say, I take uh, Gmail, for example, um, you normally you don't see uh, disruption in the service of, of uh, when, for example, Gmail, the Gmail servers are updated. Everything is uh, always on, always working. On the architecture side, um, the new generation of forecasting uh, software that is cloud enabled um, is based on uh, containers, uh, particularly containerized microservices, typically with Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes doing the orchestration of the, um, of the containers. Um, they're also scalable and governable, and in many cases, um, they're cloud agnostic, uh, um, unless, of course, they're developed by one of the cloud providers. The delivery of the software of the new features is based on a continuous delivery schedule, which is based on DevOps principles of uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Continuous delivery enable the software to be basically always on and features to be delivered as soon as they're available. The previous uh, generation of software um, typically, uh, uh, an install the installation of upgrades would take uh, several days, taking the server down it needed to be um, to be scheduled. Now, the new generation of software, um, the the installation happens on the fly directly. There is no interruption of service, so the interruption of service is very minimal, and the features are delivered on a monthly schedule typically. And that's the case, for example, of our new uh, engine. Uh, that is mentioned here in the slide is the SAS via engine. Uh, the SAS via um, products are delivered uh, on a continuous, uh, a continuous delivery schedule every month. And uh, the engine is, uh, is a distributed engine designed specifically for the cloud. And talking about the analytical engines, they're um, distributed in memory engines. All the computation happen in memory. Uh, the, the disk is used in only for storage of data. Uh, they're designed to be elastic in a sense that when more computational power is added, uh, is needed, new nodes can be added to the cloud. And the data, the engine automatically scales 
using the new nodes that are being added. Like I said, it's designed to be resilient with uh, data redundancy so that if one of the nodes ha happens to go down, uh, the process can continue. They're also designed to be open. Um, in many times they're language agnostic um, and have open APIs. Here I have two screenshots of um, visual forecasting, which is our uh, new generation software for forecasting, large scale forecasting that we are currently developing. Uh, visual forecasting, for example, is um, as open APIs for accessing the programming interfaces that can be accessed through Python, R, Lua, or Java, or REST API. And it's also um, able to, you're able to use um, um, open source languages like R and Python. Um, here, I don't know whether you can actually see because the screenshot uh, now on my laptop, on my desktop, I can see fairly well. Now on my laptop, it looks a bit a bit small, but um, in this particular example, I have um, um, hierarchical forecasting strategy uh, running alongside uh, gradient boosting, running alongside uh, um, R, a smooth package. Uh, in this case, it's just the SMA function, the state space uh, moving average. Ivan, you may be familiar with the smooth package. Um, and if you. I've heard about it, yes. Yes, OK. And for those who are not familiar with the smooth package, it's really, really a good, uh, probably the best collection of time series uh, um, routines out there, open source, uh, especially if you need support for uh, regressors uh, in your models. Um, so. The model engines can be accessed through uh, various different interfaces and also give the ability to a user to use uh, different languages. And uh, in this case, in the, this particular project that I'm showing here, for example, I have a data set of uh, about 1300 series. Each series uh, is uh, distributed to different nodes and process uh, parallel. And it happens uh, for uh, the nodes that are SAS native, but also for the node that is uh, using R. In this case, in the node that is using R, in this case, uh, we um, run an, um, a version of the R interpreter on every thread in every node so that it, it runs in parallel. Now I'm showing here R, but it's possible to do that also with Python. And I, I should mention that. Um, I am showing examples from uh, visual forecasting uh, in some cases, uh, although, of course, because that's what I'm familiar with, that's what we developed. Uh, this, what I believe, these I believe are trends in general for a forecasting software, not necessarily limited to SaaS software. On the client side, the architecture is based uh, on uh, in browsing client applications, which means uh, it greatly simplifies uh, the IT work, but there is no, no client-side installation. You would just point your browser to a URL and the application is automatically loaded within your browser. Um, of course, this reduces IT costs uh, because there are no need for upgrades, no need for maintenance, no need for managing licenses at, uh, at the client side. All, everything is done only on the server side. And, uh, the benefit to the user is also there are immediate updates. If the server is updated, the new version is automatically showing uh, on the client inside the, inside the browser. Um, another uh, alternative or complementary technology used for clients is a progressive web application. Uh, progressive web applications are relatively new. It's a relatively new form of a client. It's a web-based application and as a native uh, application, uh, it, it has the look and feel of a native application that it's uh, downloaded directly from the browser. If you, and so not all browsers support it, by the way, at this time, uh, uh, Chrome and Edge, I think, support it. I don't think Firefox supports it. Uh, but if you have never seen a progressive web application, it, it combines the benefit of a native application on the client side with a web-based application. And if you want to try it, um, well, either you can try visual forecasting, for example, um, 
which will be coming out next week with a progressive web application client. Or um, you can try, for example, Twitter. If you go on the Twitter website, we'll see a little icon appear here on your uh, address bar that says uh, install Twitter. And you, you're able to install uh, the progressive web ap application for Twitter, and it will just look like the website. In this case here, I have side by side the browser web, the browser application for visual forecasting and the progressive web application, the PWA version of the client. As you can see, they pretty much look the same. Okay, next I will uh, look at process driven trends. First, uh, one of the main uh, process driven trend with the uh, with employment of machine learning algorithms, um, a lot of the technique processes that also have been uh, developed for machine learning are also moving to the forecasting arena. Um, and one, one uh, very uh, big trend, and you have probably heard the many from many different sources by now, is um, the demo democratization of analytics. Um, that is the enabling users um, that uh, don't necessarily have a, a strong background to be able to come up with models that are sufficiently good, um, but also enable advanced users to be extremely productive with analysis and being able to deliver uh, and productionize models uh, in a very efficient way. So this is again a, a screenshot of visual forecasting. It's um, it's a low code, no code environment where you can grab from the left side, uh, you can grab modeling node that are, uh, some of them are uh, pre prepared by, by us, by SAS. Um, other ones can be written by expert users in a company. Um, for example, on the left hand side, we have um, the LTSM forecasting. This is uh, forecasting using LTSM using TensorFlow. This was written by a colleague of mine, Tayong, and uh, I can I can I could take the node simply drop on the canvas, and uh, it will um, estimate a LT LSTM model without any programming on my side, without me actually necessarily knowing about programming. In fact, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do that because I'm not too familiar with TensorFlow. So one one trend is the again the use of local no code environment with visual process flow and uh, high automation based on expert system and in some cases also AI driven um, and by AI driven I, I for example a group uh, in our company recently worked with a, uh, with a customer to analyze uh, their override and their pattern on override and design a recommendation system based on the past history for uh, suggestions of override based on the override performance, past override performance, um, to suggest which area to override with which area to not override. And um, again, in the area of the democratization of analytics, other trends in forecasting software is the generation of automatic reports, uh, oftentimes using natural language generation. Uh, in this case, I have here in front of me one uh, report generated by um, visual forecasting, and you can see there are some portion of it that are generated using natural language generation. Uh, for example, project summary in this case says the project that I was using contains uh, 1337 series and the revenue is the dependent variable. There are five pipelines. Uh, and the champion modeling strategy is segment specific and does not use any event because I did not put any event. And you can see it's uh, written probably in a better English that I could write myself. Another um, feature that I expect to be soon integrated uh, to facilitate the use uh, of analytics is the use of chatbots. Uh, we've seen, you've probably seen chatbots already used in many application where there is a need for interactivity. Uh, we'll probably see in the future integration of chatbots uh, or um, artificial intelligence also 
for forecasting application. Um, you can probably expect, uh, and I actually seen some demos of using Alexa to retrieve uh, uh, analytical results. Also, a big focus is, uh, of course, on reusability. This is nothing new, but uh, collaboration tools directly built in in the, in the software. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this is again a screen for visual forecasting where um, this area is uh, called the exchange, exchange where user can um, upload modeling strategy and they can be shared across different users. Also within the product, um, you're probably familiar with uh, Google Doc or uh, Microsoft Office. Uh, you can see in Microsoft Office uh, 365, for example, you can see different user accessing the same document at the same time, and you can see exactly what they're doing. The new forecasting software also um, have uh, specific uh, functionality for uh, team collaboration and uh, collaboration at the same time on the same project. Um, and in this case, you can see in this, uh, uh, these modeling nodes, for example, uh, you can see that I uploaded some of the modeling nodes. Uh, my colleague Iman uploaded some some other modeling nodes, and some of them are provided by SAS by default. Um, and you can, in visual forecasting, you can share modeling nodes, or you can also share entire pipelines. Uh, pipeline is um, this visual process flow here is what we call a forecasting pipeline. The cloud computing also allowed new form of consumptions of analytics, uh, which will extend also to forecasting. And in fact, it's already happening. Um, one form is a platform as a service when uh, where users uh, can uh, license an entire platform for development. Um, is this Platform as a service is probably uh, a little less relevant for a, a end user of forecasting software, but certainly software as a service is, um, again, cloud computing enables the ability to, uh, alongside uh, the old form of where you actually buy the software pack as you install it on your local machine, um, you can also assume forecasting software as a service where the software is hosted, um, remotely, typically on a cloud environment, and uh, you'll pay for the usage, and, but you don't have to deal with the IT part of it. <clears throat> for example, you don't have to deal with the installation, with the licensing, or uh, um, any of the IT component, whether you need to change uh, some piece of hardware, everything is hosted, and you only pay for the usage of the software. Similarly, function as a service instead of a, uh, licenses the entire software, you may want to uh, license only certain functions. Uh, for example, you may want to li license uh, only the um, forecasting uh, function. A result as a service uh, is, um, again, a different type of uh, mode of consumption uh, of analytical services where you provide the data and you receive the reports. For example, you provide a time series and uh, you receive as a result the forecast. So there are changes not only in the way the software, the architecture of the software, but also in the way that the software can be consumed. And there are also uh, in the traditional forecasting software, um, the focus was uh, specifically, typically on the modeling part with employment of machine learning, uh, more and more the, focus is uh, on the entire life cycle of the analytical service of the, um, so starting from the preparation of the data, the exploration of the data, the modeling part, and then uh, the productionizing of the models uh, by registering deployment and monitoring and retrain when needed. And uh, the business part, which is uh, decision and action based uh, on the results of the model. Um, again, traditionally, the forecasting software was only focusing mostly on the modeling part and uh, only on a minor part uh, 
for the other component of the analytical cycle, um, you will see more and more forecasting software being fully integrated in uh, in a full cycle, in a full business cycle of um, um, model ops. Again, in the past, all, all these connections were typically left uh, to the users. Um, but new for the new generation of forecasting software is uh, integrated, fully integrated in an in a in an analytical cycle in an analytical cycle. Okay, and uh, next uh, I will talk a little bit of uh, algorithm driven trends. Um, like I said, uh, if you went uh, ten years ago, for example, to ISF, uh, you probably would have seen maybe one or two sessions of ISF uh, devoted to machine learning algorithms. They were typically they were about neural net. Uh, typically, Sven, Sven was uh, leading all of them. Um, now, if you went to ISF uh, the last time, I would say maybe about 50% of the sessions were about uh, at least about the 50% of the session devoted to algorithms were about machine learning algorithms. And again, if you look at the results of the M5 competitions, all the top contenders were uh, based machine on machine learning algorithms. Um, so what, what I believe we are, we are in a phase where um, we're still debating where of uh, until very recently of um, time series versus machine learning algorithms. What I believe is we're going toward is a, a blending of the two of the two forms. In fact, we have seen already the new machine learning algorithms for uh, uh, time series uh, for time series forecasting, such as, for example, DPR. They blend uh, characteristics of both um, machine learning. They blend, they blend machine learning techniques with uh, probabilistic models so that they allow uh, they allow for example to retrieve probabilistic forecast and this will be reflected in um, uh, also of course in the new generation of forecasting software um, here just as an example on the on the left hand side i have a, a forecasting modeling strategy based on a purely time series algorithm. We have uh, auto forecasting, hierarchical forecasting and a temporal aggregation model. Um, on the right hand side, uh, I, we have only uh, machine learning algorithms. We have a panel series neural network, uh, a stack model, actually that's a hybrid model with uh, neural net and time series. And on the right hand side, a gradient boosting model. Um, the new forecasting, the new generation of forecasting software allows users to combine uh, and uh, compare the various form of uh, forecasting algorithms in a seamless way. In the, in again, in the bottom, uh, we have on um, machine learning and uh, open source and uh, traditional hierarchical forecasting in the same uh, in the same pipeline. Traditionally, um, forecasting software has been mostly based on univariate model, especially using the hierarchical forecasting strategies where uh, series are divided in hierarchy and uh, each each element of the hierarchy is, is the forecasting using univariate uh, univariate method method in the past few years there's been a focus more focus on uh, global models that uh, uh, forecast the series as a group not not as a single uh, individual series uh, not individual uh, variables and where I, where I see going is um, um, where I see going the algorithm is uh, more towards uh, uh, what I would say locally global models where uh, uh, global models are uh, estimated to subset of the series where the grouping is uh, done in a dynamic way by establishing some proximity measure to find for each for each individual series the series that are within a proximity range and 
bring some information that is useful for forecasting uh, that particular series. Um, so the what I expect to happen in the future is that uh, hierarchical forecasting will slowly give way to some form of dynamic um, dynamic grouping of the series. We have seen um, in the past several research based on uh, uh, clustering or uh, determining uh, optimal or dynamic hierarchies based on clustering. Uh, what I expect to happen is that uh, there will in the future will be more based on uh, uh, dynamic based on, for example, on graphs, um, on graph theory, and um, also transfer learning applied to the different uh, local groups. Uh, so that the <clears throat> what is learned on a specific group can be transferred to a, another similar group that uh, has similar characteristics. Another area where I see forecasting uh, um, expanded towards what is already happening in the machine learning and uh, AI um, area is uh, uh, what I would call responsible forecasting to complement uh, what is typically known as a responsible AI. That is uh, the uh, expand the interpretability and accountability of models and results, especially where those models and results are used for uh, decision that are affecting uh, directly uh, people. And also to more research going to finding bias in training data. There is a lot of research uh, done in forecasting about forecasting bias, especially human bias, uh, but uh, I am not aware there is much research in, uh, in forecasting uh, in bias in the in the data itself for the training of the model. And finally, I want to also to point out some of the effects that uh, the COVID-19 crisis has on forecasting and especially those that will affect forecasting software uh, that I expect to affect forecasting software in the near future. Um, and this is a topic that could probably take a whole conference to debate, uh, but I just, just want to highlight some of the what I see the most important. Um, and first is uh, um, the COVID-19 crisis heightened the importance of having accurate and timely data. And so it, it uh, highlighted the importance of having a process for data life cycle, um, having accurate and timely data and the ability to react to changes uh, in the data has been proven, uh, of course, critical, for example, for retailer to adjust to the ever-changing conditions. Um, similarly, the tracking of the models uh, and the need for having a process for analyzing the model lifecycle. Uh, models need to be uh, adapted quickly to the ever-changing conditions. This has also been uh, uh, going on for some for some time. Uh, the need to have to react quickly quickly to changing condition, for example, with uh, demand sensing technique, um, and th this will probably uh, be more and more um, important in the in the coming future. One more thing that uh, COVID-19 brought to evidence is the need to have probabilistic forecasting and risk assessment. Uh, forecasting software has uh, often only focused on the, the mean uh, and providing point forecast. Uh, but risk assessment has been uh, the ability to provide risk assessment and to provide scenario analysis for the different scenarios as something that uh, has been, uh, it was known before, of course, but has been uh, brought up to more evidence uh, with uh, COVID-19. And uh, with this, um, I think I'll stop here. I'll just uh, have a one more slide uh, with a word from our sponsor. Uh, if you're interested in uh, checking out visual forecasting, you can go to um, sas.com bf um, and there you can also sign up for a trial. Um, visual forecasting is uh, the product that we're currently in development.
developing and uh, it has built in data preparation, programming interfaces, automatic data segmentation and interactive modeling and exploration, automatic pipeline and distributed open source and open programming APIs. And this is it from me. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer questions. Right, thanks uh, Michele. Right, uh, before we move to questions, I actually asked Oliver Scher, who uh, presented, was it in October, about a software survey that we've conducted. And uh, I would be interested to hear, I think we all would be interested to hear what he has to say, if he has any comments or questions to Michele. So Oliver, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ivan. And thanks, Michele, for this. Uh, presentation very nice uh, to see and I think there is a lot of overlap uh, with what uh, the survey we uh, well I presented and you know Ivan and Robert and Alisa was working on in over the past summer and uh, I have a few, you know a few um, points maybe we could just you know I would be interested to hear your opinion or your view I think which I think is not ideally reflected also in the survey but maybe you have an insight and maybe I start with this you know, up, up, we now have this like much more options, I would say, you know, with the visual forecasting and so on, um, you know, in more interaction. The question is I have is, you know, do you see a difference in terms of adoption of those type of software in either in terms of geography or industry or segment of a company size, for instance? Um, you know, that would be something I've I think it would be interesting to hear if you, from a software vendor's perspective of if you, you see there any uh, clear trend or something like that. Um, the, the new generation of software, which is uh, cloud based, is typically designed from, uh, from the get go for large scale. So the adoption uh, that I've seen, uh, I, I don't have uh, full data actually because I don't uh, typically, uh, I don't. <coughs> Uh, I, I don't deal directly with customer. Uh, as you know, we are we work in R&D, not directly with customer. But it's uh, the adoption I've seen is mostly by large companies, and uh, uh, obviously in the uh, Western, mostly in the uh, <clears throat> you know US and Europe. Uh, <clears throat> that that. Mostly because there's the new, again, the new software is made for large scale um, and uh, scales to large sizes. So that's, uh, that's what uh, typically large companies are after. Um, I wouldn't say there are any specific sector that I've seen. Uh, of course, uh, retail and RPG uh, is um, one of the sector that has a large need for forecasting. And so it's not surprising that they are um, adopters. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's any specific uh, sector over another um, compared to compared to the old forecasting software. Great. Uh, any other questions, Oliver? Um, yeah, I mean, I have um, how many questions do we have? Otherwise, I have a few more. Well, we have three from the audience, so go ahead. OK, cool. Um, yeah, the other thing is obviously, you know, forecast as a service, as you mentioned. And uh, on the other hand, we have the democratization of analytics. We've, we've just seen with all this visual um, help. For me, it seems to be both go into, you know, um, they're sort of competing or competing with each other a bit. Um, or probably helping. I think this, these tools are clearly more towards um, you know, smaller companies essentially, or I'm wrong here. Yeah, my, my thinking is just, you know, that we, we have now this, you know, uh, we have seen that, you know, many software companies basically offer us a forecast as a service. And on the same side, we also noticed that, you know, there's clear, you know, more visual and, um, you know, as you say, democratization of this analytical process happening. So I think the access to, to, to forecast um, algorithms becomes a lot easier or it may may mainly not doesn't require um substantial um technical skills i would say um 
so I, I would expect that this has a, a large impact on, you know, in terms of how accessible, um, you know, would say advanced forecasting algorithms are to to companies. Yeah, well, that's that's one of the goal of uh, uh, democratize, democratizing the analytics to make it more accessible to different range of users, and uh, the software as a service and and the product, the uh, analytical product. They also try to reach different needs, uh, different customer bases, and serve different use cases. The software as a service may be uh, useful for, a, as you said, for a small company that uh, doesn't want to deal with the IT side of the business, uh, and they're more interested in just getting the results. Um, a product like visual forecasting that has a full uh, uh, support for a full life cycle may be more suited for a large company that needs uh, um, the full control of their pr process. But at the same time, uh, um, there's a high demand for a, a highly skilled data analytics engineer. And it's not always easy to find uh, qualified people, so the ability to uh, productionalize models very easily, very quickly. It's uh, something that uh, hopefully will benefit uh, um, the analyst inside the company, both in terms of uh, uh, the time they can productionalize the models, but also to give the ability to <clears throat> some data analysts that don't necessarily have the programming skill to uh, develop, uh, but they have the knowledge, the business knowledge and the knowledge of the data to develop uh, reasonably good models. Thanks, and maybe last comment if we have time, Ivan. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, that is more on the, you know, on the, on maybe what SaaS is working at the moment, but you know, I see this great visualization um, options and my thinking was just, you know, it, I think there's a great opportunity and you also mentioned that if the importance of this has seen with COVID, you know, that forecasts can be adjusted or, you know, fastly um, adopted. Is there, you know, we focus mostly now on the algorithmic side, but is there also, you know, um, work done that, you know, supports sort of the judgmental forecasting process that is happening a lot? Um, you know, especially I, I'm thinking about the process flow, for instance, internal company that, you know, if there's a automated way of, um, you know, incorporating also say, um, you know, uh, different forecasts, visualizing them and, you know, provide people with, with, with that input across a wider organization, maybe not just the demand planner itself. So, you know, as it could be uh, uh, simplified. So you're, you're asking if there, there are processes uh, for um, um, monitoring the overrides uh, and the results of the override, the performance of the override, um, yeah, actually, we, we have that in plan. We don't have it uh, right now built. We do have a process for overriding. We don't have a process uh, for, for tracking this. Uh, it has been done in for uh, as a custom project for some uh, companies, but it's not uh, right now. It's not built into visual forecasting, but that's something that we have in process uh, in, in program to do. It's um, it's a matter of priorities, of course, with the, the product is still in development and uh, we're planning to add uh, uh, more features as we go on uh, over time. Um, <clears throat> that, um, like I mentioned, that there, was, there was a project done by my colleagues of mine where uh, for a specific customer, they tracked the performance of the past overrides and they used machine learning to make suggestions, uh, machine learning models to make suggestions uh, about future overrides, uh, the need of future overrides. Yeah, because I was also thinking, you know, that could be something that, for instance, a chatbot could become very useful, especially if these, uh, you know, forecasts are presented to non-forecasting experts, maybe. You know, I think there is quite a lot of interesting, um, you know, interaction that could happen between uh, maybe experts in, you know, in sales uh, at the sales front, which at the moment do not provide this type of forecast in 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 an interactive or, um, I would say, uh, organized way. Maybe um, so. I think, that, yeah, personally, I think there is there is some interesting avenues to be explored. I'll take your suggestion on the chat, but I'll, I'll bring it back to our product manager. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Oliver, for your comments and questions. Um, we have several questions from the audience. 
The first one is about cloud services. So when we move to clouds, does it not create threats to for security? Um, so what I can say is uh, in the past couple of years, I've seen many companies going from the never cloud, never on a public cloud to we need to go on a public cloud in within the next two years. Uh, <clears throat> So all, all the security, it is true, you're delegating all the security to public uh, cloud providers. Um, there are options for a private cloud. Uh, for example, um, Red Hat OpenShift can be installed on premises. So for companies that are not interested in having um, uh, their data on a public cloud, on a public cloud, uh, they don't just, uh, uh, the public cloud providers with their security model, they can, uh, Benefit from the same uh, from the same functionalities uh, on a on on a on-premise cloud. Uh, uh, if they have the IT resources, of course they have to devote the IT resources to maintain that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Another question is from John Boylan. So, uh, more powerful machine learning methods uh, sound good, but how should software be designed so that uh, these methods are well used? Uh, and still outperform simpler methods in practice. Yeah, well, um, good for adjusting practices and processes, of course, need to apply for all the methods. Uh, typically, um, well, we, we don't do it right now by default in visual forecasting, but uh, typically you want to do a, a basic uh, forecasting value added uh, analysis to uh, determine whether you're actually bringing any um, any value to your process by adding more complicated method. Uh, in our in our software, it's uh, possible to do that by comparing. Uh, when I was showing the various pipelines, um, one of those nodes could be a, a simple naive model uh, that says uh, I don't know uh, random walk uh, seasonal random walk, um, and uh, the software will automatically compare the strategies to the to the naive strategies that you determine to be the, the baseline or um, for example you can compare to simple exponential smoothing models or a collection of exponential smoothing models. So the sound uh, for a gasting practice is uh, that uh, you guys have been preaching for uh, many many years uh, still apply and they're in, where, wherever possible they're actually built directly into the software. OK, uh, another question is from Robert, Robert Files. Mm -hmm. So for many organizations, forecasting is not a well supported function. How does a visual forecaster fit into this picture? There is a um, change in the organizational culture of, uh, of uh, the company is uh, at times is a different. Uh, it's, it's a difficult challenge. Um, by showing the value uh, is uh, probably the best way to show how uh, forecasting uh, can be supported within the company by also providing a full um, a full life cycle of management of their processes. Um, it's, uh, we believe something that can help companies to see the value and see also, like in the cases of COVID-19 now, having a um, good data, a good model for reacting quickly to changes uh, can uh, can show the value that forecast, the forecasting process can can bring to to companies. Mm -hmm. And I, well, I know that you have been mm -hmm. trying to do this for a number of years. So, uh, you probably know it much better than I do. The challenges. Uh, yeah, we know. It's uh, really pretty difficult. <laughs> is Robert, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, is that? Um, <coughs> well, I <laughs> could add a lot, I suppose. But for many companies, um, showing the value doesn't seem to be quite sufficient. And I think it's partially essentially the status of forecasting in the organization I and mean, we had contact recently with a company where it was clearly uh, using archaic uh, routines clearly some benefits and somehow 
uh, when he took when the uh, contact took it up to a more senior uh, guy, they just said, "Well, we're we're not ready for that." You know, I think that was the, the phrase. So yeah, I mean, uh, obviously there are individual companies, and we've got a lot of information about Walmart recently through the M5 competition publications in the journal and so on. Obviously, uh, Amazon and some companies investing heavily and know what the benefits are, but it seems to be extremely difficult. And uh, uh, Spiros Makridakis and colleagues are actually trying to investigate this, although focusing perhaps on smaller companies. So yes, I mean, these barriers are very real. So in a sense, although the flexibility that you've described is extremely attractive for many, that, you know, it's still Excel spreadsheets, you know, that is still where it is. We certainly have seen uh, many companies uh, reaching out to us uh, during the COVID-19 crisis uh, to improve their forecast uh, because uh, all of a sudden all their models were not performing anymore. Um, so hopefully that's a call to action for them. Um, right. I think we need to finish. Thank you very much, Michele, for presentation. Thank you, Oliver, for your comments. And uh, we will have the last uh, webinar in two weeks. So stay tuned and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk. You guys have a good evening there in the UK. Uh, yes. Have a good Bye. day in the US. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye.